Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for a presentation and interview with Alan Branhagen. Uh, my name is Felicia. I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. In a few moments, MPF Executive Director Carol David and Al author Alan Branhagen will discuss his new book, The, Min the Midwest Native Plant Primer. Alan Branhagen is Director of Operations at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, where he supervises capital improvements, horticulture and natural resources, plant curation, facilities, and information technology. For over 20 years, he was a Director of Horticulture at Powell Gardens, Kansas City's Botanical Garden, and prior to that, he had a nearly decade-long duty as Deputy Director of Resource Development for the Winnebago County Forest Preserve District in Rockford, Illinois. Alan Branhagen received his Bachelor of Landscape Architecture from Iowa State University and a Master of Landscape Architecture from Louisiana State University with emphasis on planning, plants, and design with nature. He wrote the Gardener's Butterfly book in 2001, published by the National Home Gardening Club, and has written articles for Fine Gardening, Missouri Gardener, Missouri Prairie Journal, Landscape Maintenance, and Restoration and Management Notes. In November of 2016, Timber Press published his book, Native Plants of the Midwest. The Midwest Native Plant Primer, 225 Plants for an Earth-Friendly Garden, was just released in July of 2020. Beyond public garden management, Mr. Branhagen is an all-around plantsman and naturalist, specializing in botany, birds, and butterflies, and travels throughout the Midwest and the country, visiting gardens and natural areas. He grew over 1,500 taxa of plants at his Missouri garden, Luna Ridge, nestled on six acres of woodland and meadow, and he recorded 180 species of, species of birds and 72 species of butterflies. He is in the process of creating a new natural garden on 2.5 acres overlooking the Minnesota River Valley in Chaska, Minnesota. He's already recorded um, 125 species of birds there and stewarded over 800 taxa of plants. So if you have any questions for Alan during this presentation, please use the chat feature or the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. And Carol will ask Alan your questions at the end of the presentation. This presentation and all of the previous presentations that we've had, these webinars, uh, will be av available on our Facebook page and also our YouTube channel. Alan's book and many other great items are available at our online gift shop, which is at store.moprairie.org, or you can just go to the Grow Native website and click on the store icon. Um, also, please save the date for the MPF annual dinner on August 28th at 7 p.m. This is a free event and will be a ton of, ton of fun. Uh, thank you very much, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Alan and Carol. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you so much. And Alan, thank you for being here with us. It's great to see you and talk with you. And also, in addition to all those other wonderful things that you do and you have done, you served on the Grow Native Committee. Um, Grow Native is, of course, a program in Missouri Prairie Foundation. And we sure miss you in Missouri, but I know everybody tuning in is um, really pleased to, to be able to see you and learn from you. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much, Carol. It's so great to be a part of the Missouri Prairie Foundation and the Grow Native program. I mean, what uh, model model um, programs they are. I mean, obviously I'm a life member and supporter. I've been with Grow Native since the very beginning before it was even an MPF uh, project. Yes, that's right. Thank you. And if you're just tuning in, our guest is uh, Alan Branhagen, and he's going to talk about his new book, The Midwest Native Plant Primer, and uh, has a wonderful presentation for us as well. Um, so you've written two books now, um, and the first book, uh, or three books, excuse me, but two books on native plants, and the first one, I don't know if everybody can see it, um, but this was your 2016 book, Native Plants of the Midwest, which we also sell in our gift shop, and then your new book, The Midwest Native Plant Primer, um, you, they're, they're about the Midwest, obviously, and you write about the Midwest spirit of place. Tell us what sets the Midwest apart from other places in the context of native plants? Sure. Um, I define it as the part of the country that's dominated by the tall grass prairie and the central hardwood forest and that great um, interplay between the two, what we, I guess we'd call savanna. Um, and there really is no other 
place around that has that same feel. We have, you know, a relatively flat landscape. The trees are usually kind of short and squat um, with a lot of horizontal branching. Of course, the, you know, the prairie grasses are, are usually pretty tall and good soils and just have this beautiful um, flowing in the wind nature about them that I think is just really special. And, you know, you go to the east and you get more dense forests. You go to the south and you get the swamps and the pine lands. And of course, to the west, you get the high plains um, and the dryness and the shorter grasses and to the north, the north woods. So um, to me, this, you know, this is my, the place I always want to be. I went to Louisiana State, but I came right back to the Midwest because <laughs> this is the landscape I love. And yeah, Missouri and Minnesota, you know, Southern Minnesota and most of Missouri have actually a very similar look to them. So um, the Driftless area of Southeast Missouri and the Ozarks are quite similar, so. And your, your, both of your books, and in addition to being very informative, are, are beautiful and you really capture that spirit of uh, place of the Midwest and, and all of the beautiful native plants we have here. Um, can you talk about how your two, your 2016 book, which is 500 species, and then your new primer book, how they, um, you know, how they, how they compare and um, just, can you just talk about some of the differences and, and how, um, Sure. They can be used from beginning to advanced gardeners. That's right. Um, yeah, the first book, of course, if you're more on the advanced level, you know, I really want you to pick up that book. But the, the new one, the Midwest uh, Native Plant Pr Primer, um, really was to focus on beginning gardeners and new homeowners. Um, I really, you know, we know how important native plants are and we really need to keep communicating that message and be inclusive to as many people as possible to get that message out there. So that was the, the whole purpose of this book was to make, you know, condense it down, not make it so intimidating, um, make it, you know, um, yeah, just a little more concise for beginners. Um, it's still, you know, obviously it's, it's still, great for advanced people as well. It, you know, it cuts the number of plants down <laughs> in half. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really, and again, it has the same introduction talking about the spirit of place and all these important uh, ways to garden, uh, gardening for birds and butterflies, and then has, you know, all the same, um, we, you know, we want to capture people with the beauty of these things as, as you know, Elder Leopold put that so eloquently, you know, our our love of things starts with beauty. Uh, he was talking about sandhill cranes. You know, we start looking at the, the cardinals and the goldfinches and the Baltimore Orioles and all the bright, colorful things. And as we learn about those, we get more advanced into the more unique things. So that that was the whole purpose of it, to get that hook out there to as many people as possible. Great. Um, and, you know, uh, for, when you're speaking of people just starting out, I think you have some suggestions can you share them, you know, just sort of basic, you know, top three things people can do to get started? Well, it's it's from my landscape architecture training. Um, you have to know horticulture. So you have to, you know, know the conditions of your site and match plants to your site. That, that science is always going to be there. If you, you know, live in a woods, um, planting things that like dry and full sun are probably not going to be your best choice. And then obviously you want it to function for you. Um, and, um, you know, select plants that serve a purpose for you. Shade your house in the summertime so you can reduce your uh, cooling bills or block the winter winds with evergreen so that you can also, you know, um, lessen your heating bills in the winter. Um, create plants that um, block views you don't like or, you know, attract birds or butterflies specifically. And then, then the last thing is, I mean, you know, you, you really want like I said, the horticulture science has got to be there to start with. Then you want it to function for you, but then have fun and go look at the beauty of these plants and put together some interesting combinations and uh, and really, um, you know, revel in the the aesthetics, the, the unique beauty, the foliage, the winter interest, the flowers, and, and that component. So, so those three things that I always like to start with. Uh -huh. Great. And um, you also have developed a top 10 steps for transforming landscapes into eco-friendly oases. And I think that's what you've got for us in your um, PowerPoint. Would you I, like to just to start that? I, I would. So let's see, hopefully this will 
advance properly. So um, everyone's seeing the cover of my book on the screen, I hope. So, yes, I see it. All right, that's the cover <laughs> of the new book. And <laughs> you know, it is for earth-friendly gardening. And um, I wrote this not as a rehash of everything else. It really, a lot of it is based on my personal experience. And of course I've gar gardened in Iowa, Illinois, um, mostly in Missouri, 21 years of my adult life, and then uh, now in Minnesota, and of course I practice these things. And the picture on the right I just took on Sunday of my front yard, um, that's anise hyssop, which is an upper Midwest plant, so not native to Missouri, though it'll grow well in Missouri. And anyone know what that bee is on there? It's, it's the federally endangered rusty patch bumblebee. So, when I see things like that in my yard, you know, yeah, now up to 127 species of, of birds, um, I feel like you know this. This is why I do this. Um, you know, of course, that bumblebee used to be very, very common across the Midwest and East, and now has a you know it's just uh, reduced in numbers so that it is endangered. So starting with that, but um, and then these 10 steps. Um, I never really said it, but they ultimately are about reducing lawn. And this picture is actually Luna Ridge, my house outside Kansas City, uh, near Bait City, Missouri was the address. Um, but when I bought that property, um, this is sitting on my front porch looking up to the uh, county road. It was kind of a rural subdivision. and. I, I should have had a before picture, but it was absolutely all lawn under all those trees and there was nothing but lawn. <laughs> and um, the first thing I did was of course, start to connect the groups of trees and I kept the lawn. I think you can see my cursor, can you Carol? Yes. Going on that oval, that's kind of like um, my front outdoor room in the lawn where I could be sitting in a chair. Actually, I wrote, a lot of the first book sitting in that space, to be honest with you. Um, and of course, tick and sugar free by having lawn, um, but you know, creating all the, adding all these other native plants, uh, mostly savanna and woodland species. Um, there's more sunlight up by the road where I had more prairie species. Um, and then there's also a swath of lawn going, uh, wrapping around the house. And I did that for again, access, you know, there's a septic field and so on that, you know, I wanted access to. And, and also, you know, I remember really big dry years in Missouri where I want that as a fire break. Um, um, so just, just keep that in mind. But um, so yeah, um, overarching all these things, think about reducing your lawn. I guess we'll start with that. But um, going back to my 10, um, the first thing, people need to look at their landscapes and assess them for invasive plants. Um, and this is, these are pictures from my Minnesota home. Um, the picture on the left is my front yard and the picture on the right was my backyard. Again, it's two and a half acres um, from the house. It actually drops off about a hundred and some feet um, a beautiful wooded slope. And of course, the tree in the front yard is a nori maple, which is an upper Midwest and eastern Midwest invasive. It grows in Missouri. It doesn't seem to get away in Missouri right now, but it still is a, a tree that, you know, is not native. It's a milky sap maple, so all our native insects are not designed to feed on it. It was like having a plastic tree in the front yard, plus there were seedlings all over in my woods. Um, and then on the right, um, you see all the piles of work I did. The, the backyard woods was choked with buckthorn, much like down in Missouri, um, Amur honeysuckle. And so I liken these um, to most of you folks down in Missouri that um, calorie pear and would be the nori maple and Amur honeysuckle would be the buckthorn I cut. And I am so glad I did put the energy and and resources to remove those things. And the next picture is uh, looking into my backyard um, after all the buckthorn was removed. I mean, I cut it myself by hand. Um, I get migraines, I can't use things like chainsaws. Um, I did it all by hand, but again, it was my workout. And, but I did hire a company to come chip it up and, and uh, remove it um, after that. Um, but just going back to that picture that the tree, you know, with my cursor is you know, the same one on the right here, a sugar maple is a, a northern red oak there and hackberries there. 
which of course are, whoops, all, um, there's the same northern red oak, so you get the feel of what that's like. And now, you know, the native plants I can plant in there, a lot of them are just coming back on their own. Um, and then here's the front yard, um, looking from my porch down, and the nori maple used to sit right there. And I planted that now with a native birch grove. And of course, birches, um, you know, not too far behind oaks is one of the most beneficial trees for a wide diversity of insects and so on. And, and I underplanted it with red twig dog, which of course the northern uh, upper Midwest species, you know, rough leaf dog would be great in Missouri. Um, but I'm just amazed already at the songbird use um, in that front yard. So um, really do look at your landscape, um, assess if you have invasives, and to start with really think about um, removing those as your first task. So, and there's the anise hyssop uh, in the front yard, all that blue that the uh, bumblebees are going crazy for. Um, the second thing is, um, you know, planting a shade tree or a grove of shade trees. And again, I'm using the left picture is my house. It actually faces the Southwest. And even here in Minnesota, it gets hot in the summer and the sun is really bright. And I swear to God, it's 120 degrees on that side of the house. So uh, you can see the newly planted tree. The first thing I did was plant a white oak, which again, um, if there's any tree you could plant, you know, an oak is, is the best thing you can do with attracting the most diversity of insects. And of course, its mast is also the number one um, thing that uh, wildlife feeds on the acorns. So uh, white oak there that someday will, and of course they actually do grow, grow pretty fast if you take care of them, will shade that part of my house. I will say that I got impatient and I actually added a honey locust in there as well, um, growing right out of that yew. Um, that um, I hope grows a little faster and uh, cools down my house quicker. On the right is, I think, especially, um, well, you saw it in my front yard where I placed the Nora maple. Um, we need to look at a woods and trees are often in groves and, you know, that right there, our river birch um, and, you know, a persimmon, a grove of persimmon, a grove of sassafras, um, black cherries, um, heck, why not, a, you know, Put a bunch of oaks together too that's just fine but also think of of that and you can see there it's actually native sedges underneath um so reducing lawn that that picture actually is from Ryman Gardens in Ames, Iowa but I thought it would give you kind of an idea in the long run yes it's okay to plant uh trees um even though uh, close together even though a lot of or ordinances say you know things have to be like 30 feet apart um when I used to do garden designs I'd always have to get a um some kind of variance, <laughs> but always did. Um, and then the third thing I have is uh, planting a windbreak of evergreen trees. And again, um, in the Midwest, those Northwest winds in the winter, um, just by blocking that against your home or even any outdoor space, I mean, you really create a nice microclimate. Uh, the original settlers knew what they were doing when they were planting those. And of course, they're also great cover for wildlife. And uh, my number one native across the Midwest is Eastern Red Cedar. And I know, Carol, we've, we've talked about how it's something you don't want on a prairie, um, but it really is a great garden plant. And um, the picture on the right, some people say, oh, I hate the way it looks in the winter. And I'm like, that's the, especially the male trees with all their pollen cones in the winter have that orangish look, but I think that's, that's spirit of place, you know, that actually ties in so well with native grasses and so on in the winter landscape. I love that color. Um, and of course, red cedars are very, very long lived. Um, uh, and here I didn't talk much about climate change and sequestering carbon, but you know, same with my first picture on the shade tree, planting something that's really long lived like a white oak, you're really gonna help out. And for evergreens, uh, red cedars can live a long, long time. And, um, I don't worry about them having cedar apple rust um, and infecting apples and things like crab apples because, you know, bio-resistant varieties of those things. Um, and of course, the fe you know, uh, red cedars are dioecious. The females have the blueberry-like cones, which uh, wildlife really, really like. So um, plant an evergreen. And again, um, 
you know, I worked a, a lot of years in land management and red cedar was like the easiest thing to control in a prairie fire or cutting it off and it's done. So it's, you know, don't get too excited about that you're uh, causing a problem on that end. Um, and then plant small trees wherever appropriate, giving a little more human scale, a little more depth to a woods, a little more color on the edge of the woods. And, you know, Eastern Redbud is my favorite selection for the Midwest. And in my new yard, I've planted eight already. And, uh, you know, here's pictures. Um, I mean, take out the Redbud from this picture. Um, it's actually at the Minnesota Landscape Ar Arboretum in one of our gardens. But look at how this creates such a beautiful space as you enter uh, that component of the garden. And red buds grow really fast. And, and look at the character, of course, that they can uh, have over time, uh, living sculptures. And of course, you know, uh, my books will talk about all the other, you know, service berries, flowering dogwoods, pagoda dogwoods. I mean, there's wild plum, many, many, many to choose from. Uh, planting a hedgerow or mass of native shrubs, again, to maybe screen the neighbors um, or screen some unsightly smaller view, uh, but you really do create great habitat by that. And the picture on the left I had, I had to put in here, it's actually uh, the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum actually has a hedges collection that shows hedges, um, different varieties of hedges people can do, even though they're kind of passe because people don't trim anymore. But Carol, would you dare to guess what that shrub is? It's actually native in Minnesota and Missouri, though you probably couldn't grow it in full sun. In uh, is it hate? It's yeah. leatherwood. Oh, leatherwood. Oh, yeah. Which it would be, a, you know, it's like I never, I about fell over when I first saw it in our collection, and I thought, well, why not? Leatherwood grows so sh slow and tight. Um, what a great choice! And I didn't even catch that in my book. Dang it! Um, you need to add that on there, but. Um, one, one other one, like uh, the, the lance leaf buckthorn, um, I know Missouri Wildflowers carries that now, actually makes a great hedge and takes shearing if you, if you had a space like that. But of course, leaving the tree, you know, the shrubs natural is, is actually going to be your best bet. And on the right, that's gray dogwood, uh, which of course native in northern Missouri, um, rough leaf dogwood in most of Missouri would be, a, or nine bark looks very similar, um, you can see it in flower, um, but great habitat. So. And then, you know, plant a diversity of native perennials um, and obviously think about each season. So this is the new garden in front of my house. And on the left is, you know, uh, late spring. Um, the yellow is all lance leaf coreopsis, which of course is also does really well in native to Missouri. Uh, there's foxglove penstemons with the white. Um, and here the pale purple coneflowers are coming on. And here's from just a little while ago, a couple weeks ago, the uh, blazing stars at peak, the pale purple coneflower is still lasting long, world milkweed coming in. Um, and then, you know, but don't forget about the uh, end of the season and what things look like in fall and winter. And, you know, a lot of our prairie grasses are very beautiful. Here's prairie drop seed. This is Cite Oats grandma. Um, I actually do have some big blue stem. I have them carefully uh, clumped because it's kind of a formal landscape here. Um, but, you know, and, and, you know, Grow Native has some really good recipes for things like this, if you are, are, want a little advice on that. But, you know, this is your chance. You know, this is a hot southwestern, southwestern facing uh, sandy gravelly hill slope. So obviously looking at uh, dry prairie plants is exactly perfect for that condition. So, and of course, everyone will have a little bit different. Um, and then adding a water feature, um, then you can add all kinds of unique water loving plants. And of course, all wildlife needs to have water. So um, the picture on the left is just from a wild ones tour that I like. Um, what a great place to listen to the sound of water and the creatures that come, the frogs that sing and so on. This is my new water garden in my backyard here in Minnesota and you know already it, it had pileated woodpeckers drinking out of the water mm -hmm. and of course um, various warblers in, in spring migration splashing around in it the goldfinches and the young orioles and you know it just um, if you can work in a water feature even if it's just in a water container uh, it really makes a difference and um, and I've got some neat native native sedges that I've added um, but uh, really, really do recommend it. 
And then the use of vines, um, especially, in, well, like in Japan right now, um, when they had Fukushima go down, they really had to have energy conservation. And one way to cool down spaces and buildings bar in tight spaces is to add vines. And, you know, this actually is a wall in, in downtown Minneapolis, and that's you know, native Virginia creeper growing on it, which of course is, you know, native from here all the way through Missouri. But take away that Virginia creeper and think about that facing south and how hot that would be. And now by adding Virginia creeper, you've cloaked it in green. Virginia creeper is a great plant for pollinators. The flowers are incredibly nectar rich. Um, I had it growing on my house in Missouri and I'd walk out the door when it was in bloom. You hardly notice the flowers, but you could hear the buzz of the bees. Yeah, I have the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, th and then of course the fruits, um, it, uh, Fruits early in the fall, very um, lipid, uh, fat-rich berries for migrating songbirds, and a lot of our uh, warblers and things really do migrate, you know, starting in the latter part of August and uh, early in the fall. This also colors up early in the fall, and I've heard, you know, some people speculate, uh, biologists, that it coloring up, it, it kind of flags it that, hey, I've got, uh, you know, fruit and, and birds learn to see it when it's red, when the rest of the tree is still green. Um, but you can, you can, um, I love vines and their versatility. Uh, even if like, let's say you had a ginkgo, which we know is a really poor for wildlife tree, but there was no way you wanted to take it out. It was shading your house, the city had planted or whatever. Um, how you make that a better uh, environmental choice is plant Virginia creeper at the base and let it crawl up in the trunks. And then you've added that really great native plant to help that situation out, so. Yeah, that's a really good point. And Alan, also, I know you're you're really expert birder. Um, depending on the the vine, I mean, vines can really help add some nesting habitat, can't they? You bet. Uh, absolutely. Um, and of course, yeah, all of them grow a little bit differently. Some have a little more branching to them and create great structure for them. But um, on the picture on the left, I have to laugh. There's um, some people call these botanical death matches, but <laughs> um, if you've got the space and can let vines just kind of ramble up uh, over, uh, could be a tree that you don't care that, well, most, most mature trees are completely compatible. Or even an understory, uh, maybe something you don't care that much, prickly ash or something, let these things climb up over it. Whoops, excuse me, I didn't mean to jump forward there. And um, it's amazing the, the wildlife habitat you create with that. In my Missouri yard, what I had Dutchman's pipevine and um, wild grape and Virginia creeper and um, the smilax, why my, uh, the carrion flower all together and what a great menagerie that created of habitat. And then of course you got the pipevine swallowtails on the pipevine, the curved light outlet on the smilax and you know, all the, all the birds coming to the berries on the grapes um, it, and on the Virginia creeper. And it's amazing what you can do, but you know, you, you do have to realize that these are pretty vigorous plants and, and have the space for them. Though again, vines are also easy to control. When they get too big, one snip and you, you, can, <laughs> you, you, can, you, can, you can set them back if, if they start to go too much. So. And Alan, you, you touched on this, but there are four questions about it. So I might just stop you. Sure. Um, at the Virgi you're, so you're, yeah, the Virginia creeper, you don't think will be harming trees, or at least not most trees. Could you explain a little bit more? I would say it never, it, it's completely compatible. Obviously, it co-evolved with all our, our native trees. Um, growing up, uh, mature trees, the only issue is if you're planting a new tree, um, you, you know, you may want it to get really established and so on before you let something like that climb up on it, because obviously it can, um, small trees and so on, it can compete um, with obviously photosynthesis, so that's not a good idea. But yeah, this um, this is actually a white oak tree here, and at my house it was an old walnut that I let, let my menagerie climb up on, and it was just fine. <laughs> so... Um, any other question right now? Okay. Uh, maybe we'll just we'll just keep going because I know okay. you've got some more, and then we'll get back to some questions. And then um, you know, British gardeners laugh at Americans with our love of mulch and our seas of mulch. And you know, one thing is, I give up the mulch. Uh, <laughs> grow native plants as much as you can, um, and you know, again, they are sequestering carbon. They are cooling down that space. They are providing, you know, like on the sedges on the left there. 
um, you know, it's a host plant for the dun skipper. And um, a lot of my sedges in my woodland, I was watching the turkeys snip off all the seeds earlier in June when they were going right. And of course, you know, uh, those fallen seeds, a lot of songbirds are scratching around for in the fall, like white throated sparrows and juncos in the winter and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, wild ginger and of course our ferns, there's maidenhair fern, um, which, you know, widespread across the Midwest, if you have shade. Um, I think that's pen sedge on the left, which Pennsylvania sedge, which um, is, you know, does pretty well in sun or shade and very, very common in uh, savanna areas, especially, I think more in northern Missouri, Missouri and northward, but um, does really well um, throughout Missouri. Cedar sedge is another really good choice. Uh, for most of Missouri, and that's also native up here. Um, so yeah, I've had people, I, I mean, I don't really understand what you're saying, and it's like, just think about it. These things are photosynthesizing, they're grabbing carbon, they are enriching the soil beneath them, you know, compared to, you know, mulch. I mean, so right. it, it, it really does make a difference. And then my last 10th uh, one, um, which I know you can take as being a little bit against the first one, but you know, a lot of our uh, bees, I guess it is close to 70%, are ground nesting and, you know, pr providing some kind of uh, bare earth spots. Um, I still don't, you know, I don't mean mulch on them either. Uh, a lot of these things don't want to nest in the mulch. Um, and having some areas with self-sowing annuals, um, and it's a daisy fleabane, daisy fleabane on the left, which isn't in my new book because uh, it just shows up if you have a bare space, <laughs> and I, you know, that's actually for my Minnesota garden. But I had that also in my Missouri garden, and it's a, you know, a great uh, nectar source and kind of in the in between, you know, the um, spring flowers and the summer flowers. So it's in a, a really important time, and of course has uh, excellent seeds as well for wildlife. Uh, Black-eyed Susan's on the right. That is in both books. Well, Daisy fleabane's, of course, in the big book. Um, but, and, and, you know, at my house, um, the areas that I've actually let kind of the turkeys decide that I have tur wild turkeys, yes, in suburban Minneapolis here. And, uh, but, you know, a place for them to wallow around. Um, I don't have any, people have asked me, don't they bother your gardens? And I'm like, no, not really. I never had an issue with them. Um, I kind of let them be where they are and they create some habitat for me. So um, that's the whole reasoning beyond, uh, behind that, and you know, we really do have some beautiful uh, annuals. One of my favorites from Southwest Missouri is the American basket flower, which uh, mm. I've actually had naturalized in my Minnesota garden now, um, but has those great big uh, feathery lavender blue flowers, which are great in nectar and a great seed source. So, and of course, those these types of things really need a little bit of disturbance to self sow. Um, so that's a good way to. Uh, kind of create the best of both worlds on that. So those are my 10, I think that, yeah, see, that's it. Um, those are my 10. Great, and there, there are a number of questions and I, I was gonna yeah. comment also on the self-sowing annuals. I, I, I think of the Daisy Fleabane as a, a, an always welcome party crasher. <laughs> that's a good way to- Showing up, and, and I think in a way, um, uh, this is really this practice or step is really not exactly incompatible with your last slide because these these self sowing native annuals can fill in space that more pernicious non natives that you might not want. Um, so um, I know even like in a prairie reconstruction, sometimes we get irritated when we see things like ragweed coming up. Um, of course, you don't want that in a, in a garden, but it's a native and it's sort of filling in that space instead of something really bad that's going to last a long time. Yep. Yeah. Um, most, yeah. Most of our annuals, I, I discussed that in the, in the bigger book, you know, they really are the, the soil healers and part of those, it's, you know, I, I liken them to a scab. Some, some of them, like ragweed, aren't necessarily so pretty, but they, you know, heal the earth and uh, let the next wave of succession uh, come in. So, in in the in your steps, uh, one thing I noticed is you're really looking at different sort of levels of vegetation, from the canopy tree to um, the ground cover. Not only is that aesthetically pleasing, and not a, not only you know, that's helping to store as much carbon as you can, really utilizing a lot of space, 
but it's also providing all these different strata for, for insects. And you told me a story the other day of your neighbor walking by. You wanna share that story? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I was um, a neighbor walking by with his dog and I was afraid, oh no, he kind of stopped me and wanted to talk to me. And I was like, oh gosh, what's he gonna say about my landscape? But he goes, you know, thank you for doing this. Um, every, every time I walk by and hear all the singing insects in your front yard, it's just a little piece of paradise. And I, I was just like, that it kind of took, took me aback. I, I take it so for granted. And then I, you know, the mailbox is two houses down and I had to walk down and it, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you hit the typical suburban lawn next door and it just is like dead silence compared to um, the snowy tree crickets and the field crickets and everything else uh, uh, going on in my yard. So um, yes, that's, um, to me, that's an added, added bonus of all this. Yeah. Great. And I love it that you picked up on the whole strata. I was <laughs> I was absolutely going for that. And obviously that's how I broke the sections of the book down on the first one, um, because you're absolutely right. You really want to think of canopy all the way to ground cover and all those components in between to really make the best use of your, your, your space. Um, and, yeah, and, and you know, a lot of people, you know, gardeners love trying new things and oh you know and so this gives you an opportunity to utilize all these opportunities to try so many great plants. Um, we do have a number of questions and um, some comments and I'd like to um, launch into those now if that's okay with you Alan. Yes, sure go ahead. Um, and James has a suggestion not an annual but bellflower um, Campanulastrum americanum is a great biennial self-sower in shadier areas. Yeah, I, I could have put that in here. Um, it, it, it's one I really have a lot of fun with, um, letting it do its thing and pairing up with different plants each year wherever it comes up. And the, the first year um, plant looks almost like violets, just, you know, and just make sure you leave that because, yeah, it is a true biennial. Um, and then it bolts and flowers uh, the next year. And actually, I believe it has also another a specific bee that uh, pollinates it. And that's another reason to, to really get into diversity is it's amazing how every single one of these things has a, a creature that's tied specifically to it. And, um, you know, the more you add, it's kind of like, um, I, I have a program where I show like the um, the, a map of, of where all the airports are and all the airlines and how they all connect and it's all the little you know the little airports support the big airports and and the hubs and and you got to think that way the oak is the hub and the maple is the hub but you've got to have all the other little little supporting characters in there to make the whole system work yep well put i've um, got a few questions here on on lawn um um, what's the best way, so in replacing lawn with natives, what's the best way to remove sod and how much needs to be removed in order to plant na new natives? Well, yeah, you, you really do need to kill it. And um, for me in my front yard where I had fairly extensive areas, I did use glyphosate and I know that's really frowned upon, but I used it at the lowest level and it, to me it was a one-time thing. Um, in other beds in my yard that are smaller, um, it, it's really worked really well. I put down cardboard and then um, a heavy layer of compost, local compost over the top of that. And you know, that worked beautifully too. Um, you just have to, you know, you have to wait longer for, um, you know, the grass to be killed out underneath. Um, but that is a really, really good way to do it as well. And I, I recommend that. It's just for very extensive areas that becomes quite a project. That's right. And for those who are not familiar with chemical names, glyphosate is an herbicide, so it's not it's not kill, killing insects. It's it's designed to kill plants. And if I, I, I like to think of it as you know, and, and when when you're when you're dealing with this kind of situation or uh, ecological restoration, it is a very important tool um, because we really are in a race against time to uh, restore native biodiversity to. Um, to provide habitat for so many insects and things like the rusty patch bumblebee. So, but I'm glad that you mentioned both different, you know, the 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 non-chemical and the chemical um, uh, purpose. And maybe you could add too. You don't want people to till that bare ground because so maybe you could talk a bit about that. 
Right. And again, yeah, when you till, yeah, you ruin the soil structure as well as you really promote weeds. And so, yeah, my, my, all my front beds, the, the ones I use glyphosate on, right, I planted right in the dead grass and then put compost over the top. Actually, the birch grove, yeah, I killed the grass and then put a heavy layer of compost there and then planted everything into that. Um, but right, absolutely no till. And um, both gardens in Missouri, Luna Ridge, and this new one, um, it, it is neat to see once you start getting all this together, how um, organic matter not tilling, um, all those microbes and fungi and all the things happening down below. I, over time, you can just see how plants like weather dryness better. Um, you know, the system starts to work and you, you, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up too because we, we have to really consider the soil as well. It's really important. Great. Um, but the boy, we got a lot of questions. So I'm gonna to try to uh, pick up the pace a little bit. Um, how no, I thought, close- Yeah, I was trying Oh, no, to no, not you. I just need to be more efficient with the questions. Um, how close together can we plant oaks and how close to a sewer main? Well, on, on a sewer main, it depends on what kind of oak. If you're a, a floodplain species that's more water seeking, I wouldn't, you know, it's more of an issue like a pin oak or a swamp white oak. And some of these upland oaks don't do that at all. Um, so it depends on your site. Um, so that's a really good question. I would, I would pick one, uh, you know, more of an upland species like white oak um, that, that really doesn't have water seeking roots. Um, and go look at a forest and look at how close sometimes oaks are together. So um, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. I mean, you could almost plant them side by side. In fact, my white oak in the front, I I'm toying with adding a second one up there just to create a pair that might be kind of interesting. So I, I, I don't know why, you know, we've got this ingrained in us that everything has to be so many feet apart and, you know, look at a prairie and how things can quote, how close things can grow together or a woodland, you know, it, it, it really is inspiring and, and take a look at that and get some inspiration. Um, I have a question about what's a good ground cover to grow under a dogwood tree? So full sun, dry clay soil. Um, I would probably say round leaf groundsel would be my first choice. Um, the Pacara um, obovatus. Um, so, you know, it, it, it spreads really well into a evergreen ground cover of rounded green leaves. And then of course in, in spring has those, it bolts out those beautiful yellow flowers, which are really nectar rich, great for butterflies. And then does, especially if you have from, um, it, it's not self-fertile, so you've got to make sure you have two, two separate plants, not cloned plants, um, and you can get some good seed set, and uh, that would be my number one choice. Great. Um, question about your new book, which I think will um, kind of inform on, on some of the other questions we have about plant choices. How did you, how did you choose 225 species from the 500 in your, in your 2016 book? And yeah. of course, these are, we have, we have um, people tuning in, I'm thinking probably mostly from Missouri, but, but, I, but from surrounding states too, perhaps. And, and of course, these plants, um, they're Midwestern plants, but the ranges could be throughout the whole area or some might be, you know, native in just one part of the Midwest. So can you talk about those 225 species? Sure. Well, it, it again was based on my experience in Iowa and Illinois and Missouri and Minnesota. And I really looked at, you know, what I thought people are going to have success with, what I had success with and are readily available. And um, yeah, I know you, you mentioned on, um, you know, some of them aren't, aren't native throughout the Midwest. Like I did have moss flocks in there because it, it's, it's native more in the Eastern Midwest in Ohio and Indiana. And, uh, but it does really well throughout the Midwest and in the other parts of the Midwest when you grow it, it's still like in my front yard, I have planted it. It does really well in Minnesota and it still attracts the pollinators. Um, I had a grapevine epimenus, one of my favorite spring flying, spring day flying moths nectaring on it this spring. So, um, but you know, Phlox bifida, the cleft phlox, which is in the bigger book, you know, is more um, prevalent in, in Missouri and that would be a, a, a great substitute. 
I did try to, you know, always think about that component of it. Things like catalpa trees are not very common in the Midwest, you know, more in Southeast um, Missouri and Southern Illinois and Southwestern Indiana was their native range, but they grow really well all the way into, you know, to Minnesota and have naturalized all the way up here. And the corresponding insects, one of them, the catalpa sphinx can feed on no other plant, has followed that throughout its, you know, its new naturalized range. Um, so to me, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm not that absolute purist that it, it really is a, a Midwestern tree and it does has all the ecological functions in Southeast Minnesota, it does, and it's pre-settlement native range. And I always like to talk, you know, where I'm at right now was under a mile of ice <laughs> not that long ago in the big scheme of things and the plants that are here um, in Northern Minnesota were in the Ozark. So, you know, it's, um, I, I sometimes like to look at that big picture, so I don't want to get too too weird with it all. But you know, it, <laughs> it it's a whole other debate on its own. Oh. And plant plant ranges are are dynamic; they're always moving around. They were moving around before us. So anyway, go ahead. And um, I know that you obviously are an expert and love native plants, but there are non-native plants that you love as well. And you you wrote an article that we can share um, via email with registrants uh, for, for our Grow Native program on in integrating native plants into a non-native landscape. And I think that's really important because so many homeowners will have some non-native shrubs and they may not have the energy or, or time to remove those. And so I, I think you would say that you know you don't have to remove every, every I mean certainly the the invasive mm -hmm. things but could you speak a bit about that and do you talk about that in your new book let me see I did that part get in there um you know that's embarrassing I can't even remember I haven't reread it since I did the manuscript <laughs> well, well, I'm honest with you but um it you know gardening yeah it should be fun and Right, it, you know, you don't want to bust your budget, um, and yeah, as long as things aren't in, invasive um, and integrating them. Um, like I, I do really like peonies. They remind me of my parents and grandparents, and I have uh, them in my front yard. But then I've got them paired with, and and it happened all, all on its own. It's like what a great pairing. Swamp milkweed came up in between them. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of overshadows them in flowers, um, you know, in midsummer to late summer. And it's like, what a great pairing. I, um, I can have the peonies earlier, um, which are, you know, very, very long lived perennials, um, don't take a lot of energy and so on. But then the swamp milkweed comes in and all the wonderful insects, uh, and of course the monarch uh, butterfly um, tied to that. So, and even in my front yard, I mean, I purposely did plant some more traditional perennials across the front of my property and most and part of that was also to um, tie in with the more traditional landscape around me and, and make it more accepting um, to the neighbors. Um, so I did use things like Walker's Low Catmint, which is not invasive and also a great nectar source. Um, the natives are probably going to take it over and I'll let them over time and I'm planting more natives down around there. Um, but it was a great gateway to um, show the neighbors that I wasn't creating a weed patch. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, and it, yeah, yeah, I guess, you know, if, if um, I think sometimes people are afraid it has to be all or nothing and, it, and, and I think you would say, no, it doesn't, you can right. incorporate natives into an existing more conventional landscape. Right, and my biggest <laughs> argument is I like to eat and how many of the things that I eat are from native plants. I mean, and <laughs> I do really talk about, you know, edible landscapes in both books. And I think that's important. There's so many things from pawpaws and persimmons and plums, you know, pecans, um, but I can't live on those alone. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, integrating, you know, more more traditional, actually the that black, or the picture right there with the Black Eyed Susans, that was my kitchen garden that I gave up on where I, you know, I, I grew leaf lettuces and things like that, but the deer were relentless and the Black Eyed Susans came in on its own and, and uh, took over, but um, anyway. There's a, a few questions about um, rabbit and deer resistant natives. Uh, uh, do you use, can you talk about fencing or 
uh, repellents or um, just right. F people fencing. like to know your, what you think. Yeah, fencing. I, I, yeah, I, there's just no way I'm going to plant completely based on those two creatures that are especially deer, you know, and I'm, I'm always supportive of like MDC or whoever and up here, you know, the Minnesota DNR and their um, measures to control those animals and especially they get in suburban settings get to be like I call them puppy deer where they're not afraid of you and just kind of sashay around and I always chase them. I always make sure that they know to have fear but um, yeah my, my garden is almost embarrassing with rabbit fencing. If you think Missouri rabbits are bad come to Minnesota oh my god. Um, so yeah fencing them out um, is the best thing you can do and, and deer yeah my, the restoration of my woods right now, that is an issue and I have to um, actually fence out um, the big cattle panels, the, the newer trees and things. Um, and then I do use repellents. Um, Repels all is the one I'm using now that's got a clove base, um, so it's not quite so stinky. Liquid fence works really well, but it is just so smelly and, uh, um, well, it just for the one night, you know, um, but it does work. Uh, plant skids is also another really, I've heard so many people had a lot of, a lot of success with that, but um, I refuse to give up my diversity of plants for those two creatures. Um, I'm just not going to do it because there's so many other important components of the web of life that I want, and I'm not going to let them knock that um, web apart. So, <laughs> um, and people don't really, you know, I, I love deer, I love rabbits. <laughs> Um, and I don't know what happened when I, back in Illinois, the rabbits would feed mostly on the clovers in the lawn. And I remember, have, you know, it wasn't the issue that I have here. Um, but, um, you know, now I do have a great horned owl in the backyard and saw a gray fox and my rabbit numbers aren't so bad right now. But um, again, yeah. so hopefully. Well, maybe having a canopy tree for a perch for predators. Uh, of course, that, that takes some time, but. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe try and encourage trees, canopy trees in the neighborhood, or if you live near, that maybe that's perhaps one other solution. Yeah, it all helps, and, and then the other thing is, if I had more, if I didn't have such a big job here, I have a dog, <laughs> great solution. Okay, great. Um, well, we, we're past the time, but there's still quite a few questions. Alan, if you're willing to continue, I'm, I'm sure people would still love to, to hear more from you. Sure. I, can, you. I can continue a bit, yeah. Okay, great. Question about um, soil amendments. Should, should, how much, if any, soil amendments should be considered since most soil around homes and small residential properties have been grossly disturbed and or removed during construction? I know that's a, uh, I feel sorry for people who are, well, how do I put that? Who inherit a completely disturbed soil landscape like that? And yeah, um, my my best advice is just compost, compost, compost. Um, add, adding compost, organic matter for the most part, um, and you know, getting some of these deep rooted um, perennials going, and um, you know, letting all the leaves fall and natural. Um, recycling program they're going so you start feeding all the good soil microorganisms and get that soil health back I mean it does come back and it does take time um, you know absolutely don't use any synthetic fertilizers that may damage that coming back um, so use only organic fertilizers um, I'm trying to think what other you know my new place um, Luckily, the soil, it was very, very, very sandy and I, you know, and, and gravelly, but it's a gravel hill. And so just adding plants that are more attuned to that habitat. Mm -hmm. But I can see where, yeah, if you have clay that's been messed around, you know, um, or a richer black soil that's all been moved around, you know, adding compost is the best way to go. Okay, great. A question about how do you get rid of invasive crown vetch from a native plant garden? Uh, it takes time. I've done it. I didn't show that. The picture in my backyard right along the rock wall was all crown vetch. And I just had to, one afternoon, I just said, you know, I'm going to tackle it. And I um, went and pulled out 
all of it. And then, yes, I had to two weeks later kind of go back through and it, it is very tedious, but like all plants, if they don't photosynthesize, they eventually uh, die. And um, right now I get weak little sprouts that aren't too bad to pull out. And I just have too many uh, original native plants and stuff that I'm, I'm real hesitant to use any um, herbicides on, but I suppose you could. Um, but yeah, it, it, it can, it can be done. You just have to assign it as a task and do it. <laughs> um, question about climate change. Um, should we be planting for climate change? For example, St. Louis may be like Texas in 50 years. And Minneapolis like Kansas City. So um, I know that's a really tough one. I think a lot of Midwestern plants are more resilient than we give them credit. Um, a lot of them are. Um, but yes, um, well, Grow Native, you're growing a lot of things that are really more Missouri Boot Heel and Southern, you know, things like American Beautyberry and Bald Cypress um, and uh, uh, Spigelia, the Indian Pink and things like that. Um, and, and even up, up here, um, a lot of Missouri plants people are planting and they're in the Minnesota native section. It always cracks me up, purple coneflowers and, and Phlox paniculata, the native form of the garden phlox. And, and, uh, the bugbane or um, black cohosh, you know, Actea semisifiga and the rumcus, the goat's beard, all those things are on the, but they're really not, you know, they're native in Missouri and barely into Iowa, some of them, and they do absolutely beautifully here. And I think um, they're great choices to, for climate change resilience. And again, they still have all kinds of beneficial insects and so on that tie in with them that I have no problem with that whatsoever. So yeah, it's, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's not like you should plant only things from the deep south. I think that's kind of silly. And like I said, a lot of these things, you know, northern red oak grows from, you know, Georgia to northern Minnesota and has a, a, a wide diversity of adaptations. And um, I know things like sh shagbark hickory have been well documented as declining in, in Missouri um, and of course expanding in Minnesota naturally. And, and so, I mean, some of it is happening um, right now. Yeah, and of course, I mean, we need to be supporting insects that are native wherever we are now. Right. So if we, if we planted, if we plan, if we thought only of the future, then we would not be supporting the things that are here now. So, I mean, right. I, I would think that planting as much, as many natives as we can that are native here now is also a good defense. It's very important, like I talked about on that web of life, that keeping that to going here so it can be resilient and, um, and you know it takes time for these things to move <laughs> so um, someone has asked is crepe myrtle which is an, a non-native is crepe myrtle considered invasive in Missouri it seeds in my yard freely mm. uh, I'm not sure if this person means that it, it itself if it's sprouting or uh, well uh, that must be what the per, what this um, yeah, yeah I don't I don't, I never really see it on invasive species lists. I, I never planted it in my yard. I know it's colorful and very heat tolerant and so on. And, but it just doesn't look at the flowers. They should be covered in bees and they're not. It's like, I just don't, you know, I, I, did, I, I when I first moved to, to Missouri, I actually planted it and I'm like, I'm not planting this again. It's, it's not providing enough, uh, you know, services for me. So I know it's pretty, but, um, so yeah, I, I don't think it's invasive, but um, right, I, it really is not a very good um, component to the natural history of a site. <laughs> um, another question about uh, not non-native invasives, but aggressive natives um, in a seeded yard, when do you, or a seeded garden, I think, when do you start removing overly aggressive natives like brown-eyed Susan and Canada goldenrod because um, those might be desirable in some places, but right. when's that point when you should be <laughs> wary? That's a, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. And it's a really complex one. Like I would never plant Canada goldenrod. I have it in my backyard and kind of some of those areas I took out the buckthorn and then I let it be because it is a really good nectar source, especially if we have a dry year. I remember the horrible drought in Missouri in 2012 and it was like one of the best nectar plants. So I'm glad I left it in certain areas where, and then I, when it gets about a foot tall in the spring, if it was places I don't want it, it actually pulls out pretty easily and I would remove it that way. 
Um, the other part of that on um, these self sowers, I mean, I've had a, you know, every site is a little bit different. And my new garden in Minnesota, I'm absolutely shocked at um, the Heliopsis, the false sunflower oxeye, and the foxglove penstemons. Oh my God, the seedlings like I've never seen before in my life carpeting the ground. And uh, I wish I'd known that. Some of it you just can't know. And so yes, I'm, I'm, I'm ha having to actively pull those out. But um, one of the solutions is um, really getting a good ground cover matrix of plants that compete to begin with. And I probably should have done that better. Um, I should have planted, you know, like a tight planting of prairie drop seed and Cytoats grandma. They're doing that themselves now and I'm liking that because they kind of uh, form that, um, I don't know, it just, it, you know, helps keep out the weeds and helps the self-sowing um, reduce that. And, and a lot of new planting schemes and designs, they're really wanting you to think of a new bed in terms of get that ground cover of plants in there and then put in some structural plants that you know kind of like Baptisia or compass plant or butterfly milkweed and then seasonal um, plants in there that like um, uh, the, the wild hyacinths um, in a woodland be like Virginia bluebells, things like that that come through for color but disappear and, and really thinking in that aspect but that that ground cover matrix getting that at the beginning to help reduce things from um, self-sowing so abundantly because they have to compete with it like like in a native prairie system. So that's the best, I mean, it's, that's kind of technical, but um, that's, that's, that's the way planning design is actually moving right now. Uh, just a, a couple more questions here. I have trumpet vine growing on top of a backyard wall. It has a lot of dead growth in, in it that's caused it to become like a thicket. I've noticed birds spending time there. Is it best to leave it alone for their sake or clear out the dead limbs to help the trumpet vine produce more flowers? Well, um, that's, I wonder where that came from. Um, trumpet vine actually winter killed at our polar vortex a couple years up here. So there's a lot of dead in them up here and they're recovering finally. Um, I, I would let it be for wildlife and maybe in the wintertime sometime cut out the dead just for aesthetic reasons. Um, but obviously trumpet vines really tenacious. Um, it is, you know, it is a very beneficial um, native vine, but you know, it has, it is very aggressive. You don't want to plant on the side of your house where it can run all over the foundation and things like that. It's best in an area where you can let it um, roam or have something like lawn around it or something that controls it. Great, thanks. A question, will Virginia creeper grow in shade? Yes, sun or shade, you bet. Great. Um, in, let's see, uh, what about burn, use, uh, what are your thoughts on planting in, oh, in berms to start with native plants in a garden? Hmm. Again, you know, I, um, is it a berm in the sun? Is it a berm in the shade? Is it a berm of sand or gravel? Is it a berm of <laughs> heavy clay? Um, so that that makes a, a makes it a tough a tough question. Um, and you know, is it is it a berm that you're gaining some height and you want to screen something? So you want shrubs on it that in, you could use smaller shrubs, and the berm helps give you height for screening. I mean, there, <laughs> I don't know if I have a really good answer with that without more detail on it. But it's possible. I mean, it depends. oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Please, but yeah, do look at what it's made out of and what you know, site conditions, is it in sun or shade and those kind of things, you bet. I think, um, I think we need to close with, there's three people have a similar question. I think we'll, we'll close on this because we're here after five. I want to remind everybody that um, we, we will, um, Alan's uh, presentation will be recorded on uh, uh, the Granada Facebook page and also on the Missouri Prairie Foundation YouTube channel. And Felicia will be emailing all the attendees an email tomorrow um, with um, some resources that Alan has mentioned um, and uh, it, to you tomorrow. Um, and also, I just wanted to remind people that um, Alan's uh, 2016 book and his July 2020 book are both available to purchase at um, the um, uh, our our online gift shop and that that URL is store.moprairie.org or you can go to grownative.org 
um, and Felicia will mail your books out to you. Um, so this last question is about, um, let's see, there's three similar questions. We planted a green hawthorn seedling a few years ago, it leaves out every year, but it gets cedar rust disease every year and hasn't done well. Could it be due to Eastern red cedars in a neighbor's yard down the street? And let's see, there were a couple of others. How well, far away How far away do hawthorns and other members of the rosacea, rosaceae family need to be from an Eastern red cedar due to the cedar rust? And there was another similar question. It's probably. Oh, yeah cedar quince rust, unfortunately, and that disease has actually gotten worse, especially for um, the, the, the green hawthorn, Critiga spiritus, which is really disheartening to me because it was one of the ones more resistant to cedar apple rust, and then you get this new, new disease coming along, and that's very challenging to me. I, um, and I don't, I don't really, you know, to me, it's like, unfortunately, you, you have to put up, you have to put up with it. Um, and I think of the, you know, read the, in the big book, I have a, a pretty good discussion about that under the Hawthorne section because they are such an icon of the Midwest and um, with the way they grow and, and used to be very common. And, you know, I think even herbarium specimens um, taken through time actually show how cedar apple rust and cedar quince rust have, have affected them more greatly um, recently. And, of course, that's one of the values of herbariums, um, capturing different time, time periods. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping people actually keep an eye out for if they see hawthorns with resistance that maybe we can start propagating some of those uh, varieties. Um, but right now, and yeah, you enjoy them for their winter beauty and that kind of thing. And, and just um, sometimes I think we get caught up about cosmetic, um, diseases that really don't kill something. And I, I actually had a picture of a, a hawthorn with all the orange spots from cedar apple rust on its leaves. And I, I said, if that was a coleus, people would love it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes you just have to, and, and same with galls. I was noticing some new galls out in the garden today on rosin weed. And I thought, you know, people get freaked out about this, but I think, you know, what you start, that sense of wonder on, you know, the gall wasp or whatever made that <laughs> um, and then look at it differently. It's a living landscape in, yep. many, in all of its forms. Um, sorry, we, we weren't able to get to everybody's single question, but um, we do have a lot of resources at grenative.org. Felicia will send out an email tomorrow with some resources for you. We do have native garden plans. We have lists for shade gardens, lists for or sunny areas, shady areas. Um, uh, ground covers to try. So I do hope um, you can find what you're looking for at our Grenada website and um, there is a way to contact us if you have other questions that we weren't able to have answered today. So again, thank you very much, Alan. And, and there's also a lot of emails here from people who miss you as well <laughs> from, from in Missouri. So thanks again and thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a good evening. Yeah, you're very welcome. Take care all. Bye, Alan. Bye.